I would say, you know, I entered the tech industry like many folks. I did tech support. I was a system administrator, eventually became a developer. And just working in industry in general, you kind of see all the problems with building software, shipping it to production and keeping it running. And I spent time at places like Puppet Labs, working on configuration management tools. I've spent time in places like CoreOS in the early days of containerization, trying to figure out how to build the tools that are related to that stack. And so it was very natural when Kubernetes came out to want to contribute to this thing that seems to combine all the ideas um, from the previous parts of my career. And they gave it a name called Kubernetes. And so just contributing in the early days, making sure there's a concept of a node, some of the automation around it, cloud provider integrations. And of course, if you work on something, the next natural step is to talk about that work. And that's where the community involvement really came through. Yeah, fantastic. So um, Kubernetes is one of those technologies that seems to be coming increasingly pervasive. I, I've seen you talk in other places about um, this as as kind of a, a standardized, you know, it, it's a standardization move. We're, we are standardizing the way in which we can deploy and manage more effectively distributed systems. Could you just describe that concept a little bit and why that matters so much? Yeah, so like for the record, it's 2022. I probably spend very little time on Kubernetes in the last two to three years. And there's a reason why I can do that because it doesn't change as much as it used to. Yeah. You know, I think around three to four years ago, I think it kind of hit this sweet spot. And just like Linux, the operating system, right? The ABI for the Linux kernel is fairly stable. Whatever language you're writing in, more than likely, if it can target um, a wide range of Linux kernel versions, and it will probably just work. Um, for versions that are yet to come. Kubernetes is also in that sweet spot. And so when we think about what Kubernetes is, you know, I was fortunate enough to be in one of the Kubernetes documentaries and, and the Kubernetes documentary, they asked me about what Kubernetes is. And I went on to explain like the post office analogy of a person declaring where a letter should go. And then all the things behind the scenes that it take for that letter to get from point A to point B. But for a lot of people, when they think about Kubernetes, they're not really thinking about a scalable distributed system, bin packing and all the scheduling algorithms that are built in. Most people are thinking about replacing their homegrown tools that collect, take a collection of VMs and attempt to automate them in a way that they can just run their applications across them. So if you think about the fundamentals that people were exercising, the act of scheduling, you know, picking the right node to run this application, if you look at it, what most people were doing is like keeping a spreadsheet or they had some way of classifying that this node should be the web server. And then their scripts or configuration management tools like Puppet, Chef, and Ansible, they would then just carry out those actions on those servers. And of course, most people care about things like reliability. And so if one of the machines would go down, you wanted a mechanism to restore that machine and run those applications again. And of course we tend to put these machines behind things like low balancers, right? We've been doing that for like 20 years. If you look at all of those fundamentals, Kubernetes just bakes those in. And so if you think about this from like the software perspective, you tend to have programming languages that to start out with just syntax. And maybe that syntax is powerful enough for you to build your own TCP stack or even HTTP stack. But after you do that long enough, you want to have an HTTP library. If you're really fancy, you'll put that HTTP library in the standard library itself. And then over time, you realize it's just not deserializing headers and bodies. That's just not what you're doing all the time. You actually want an HTTP framework that can deal with things like routing, maybe rate limiting, and all the high-level things that it takes to actually run an HTTP service. Kubernetes aims at that much higher level. So sometimes it's good to think about Kubernetes as an infrastructure SDK or infrastructure framework, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it's so. Uh, I, I guess, I guess, kind of generalizing that, what it's really doing is is kind of you know raising the level of abstraction so that people can focus more on the you know the goals of their software and leave more of the the accidental complexity that surrounds it by it being distributed and running in the cloud to people like you. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing, you know, a good HTTP framework does for you, right? You pick your programming language, you know, Python, Ruby, Golang, 
the last thing you want to do is try to figure out like how to deal with the HTTP spec by reading the RFC. Like that gets very tedious. And so a lot of times you just want to use a nice web framework that has all these convenient functions and handlers for dealing with the various aspects of HTTP. And so Kubernetes does that for a lot of people. And it just comes from the practice of, of doing this for so long. Maybe we just have an opinionated framework to help you do it. So, so one of the one of the common drawbacks with frameworks um, is that they tend to impro impose um, constraints on the programming model, which is kind of reasonable because they need to exert some kinds of controls. In some ways, Kubernetes seems to have a relatively light touch to me because basically you're just talking about manipulating containers, but in other ways. Forgive me, but it seems to have a reputation as being a bit difficult to get to grips with. So, yeah, I mean, it would be a fair assessment. I think most people like me, when I go learn a new programming language, like if I go look at Rust, it's memory model, memory management model, the way it thinks about expressing things that I know well in like two or three other languages, Rust seems overly complex to me. Yeah. I also attribute that to the fact that I don't know Rust. And so when you think about Kubernetes, a lot of people that come from the system administration world, the Linux OS and its user land is insanely complex. Yeah. Said awk, egrep versus normal grep, the GNU stack versus, right? It, it's, it's complex. Terminals, yeah. the POSIX standard, these things are overly complex. Most people can't name the 100 plus system calls that the kernel implements. They just use yeah. the system calls that they need. And so a single server, single operating system, most people do not know the intricacies of how that work, but they SSH, they run things on it, they start things via init systems, and they get by with just enough of that operating system that they need. And if you think about what Kubernetes does, there's also a lot of nuance that goes into not just manipulating containers. Kubernetes says, listen, your app is going to make system calls. And so I'm not going to get into the details of Java versus Ruby versus Python. I'm going to force you to create effectively a tarball mm -hmm. with your applications and all of your dependencies in it. And I'm going to take this cheroot thing that you have in this container image, and I'm going to schedule it on one of those nodes. And I'm going to hand off that to the local runtime, run C or Docker. But that's an implementation detail for Kubernetes. Yeah. And here's the hard part. Who should perform the health checks? Mm -hmm. And what should the health check API look like? Well, instead of making that from scratch, Kubernetes does say, look, your app probably needs to health check. My guess is your app probably also needs a mount point. It could be NFS. It could be some black store from the cloud provider. My guess is your app also has logs and those logs should go to a central place. My guess is your app may crash from out of memory errors from time to time. Maybe we should report those to some upstream system. What about that IP address? And once you get that IP address, should I register it into a load balancer? These are all the nuanced details that most people have never fully automated or scripted out. They end up cobbling together multiple tools, right? If you think about a world without Kubernetes, what are you doing? You have to probably use some init system. That init system, unless you're using something like system D, may not have all the properties to express all your local dependencies on a server. What are you gonna do for service discovery? Are you really going to scrape IP addresses from each individual machine and update DNS, maybe you bring in something like console. And so I think the industry, if you really think about the amount of complexity that has always existed in this part of the stack, most companies have just gotten by by building custom tools that nobody else understands and hoping for the best. And I guarantee you, if you look at those roadmaps, they have not implemented audit log, RBAC, namespaces, like all the things that it takes to have a proper system that you can actually share with other applications in a safe way. And so that total complexity, what Kubernetes does is just says, let's be honest about it. Let's encapsulate it in one system. And then let's give you an API to interact with all of that complexity. So if you're coming from system administration world where you only ever really acknowledged a fraction of that complexity, yeah, for the first time, having the full complexity landscape revealed to you can be daunting. But if you're new, I've met people who started their career just two or three years ago, 
and they've joined a team that only has Kubernetes. And someone says, I want you to deploy this application across multiple servers and ensure availability, service discovery built in, encryption, mounting volumes, and an API for collecting metrics. In their world, they're like, yeah, that's Kube CTL apply. One command. Mm -hmm. They get that by default. Cool. So there's lots there's lots of dimensions to these. One, one of the things, one of the things that seems to come out of that, I, I guess, is as you say, you know, it, it, it so much depends on your starting point. If you are coming into this new and you are kind of sheep dipped in the in the model from the start, then it's easy. You know, you, you you're gonna you, you're gonna you, you're gonna, that's the way that you're gonna see the world. I'd say the same thing about things like test driven development. If you, you know, if you if you learn to program with test driven development, it's in natural and, and easy. And if you come at it later, it's harder work. Um, so. So that makes absolute sense to me. So, so, but like an old, old crusty duffer like me who didn't come to it from there, um, the one of the things that it seems to me is that there, there's often assumption in teams that I come across in my consultancy from time to time that it's the starting point for everything, and it seems to me that people are building, you know. Um, systems that are essentially almost single user simple systems in kubernetes because they think it's because google told them to <laughs> almost and, and i'm do I, I know that i'm doing you a disservice I, I i buy all of the things that you said i think that raising the bar in the way that you said are really important but are, are there any are, are there what's the starting point what's the nature of the project that where kubernetes is going to be you know, a, a win rather than an addition to the complexity of building the system. I do, I, I hear of teams that seem to find it an addition to the complexity of getting started. And I don't know whether that's just because they're full of boring old farts like me or whether it's because of some, some other reason. Or well, remember that the key here is use the tools you need. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you don't have to use TCP IP. Yeah. Right. You can literally say, I'm going to do this via UDP and handle all of the things that TCP gives you. That's you can totally do that right now. You can totally build an app completely. I've done UDP. that lots of times. <laughs> yeah. And so if you don't like TCP. There are some people who say TCP is too complex. It doesn't do a good job. Even yeah. HTTP3 is thinking about sidestepping it. Yeah. Okay. You, you, go, you can do that. No problem. Uh, if you have an app that can get by with a single VM, uh, go ahead. Do that. Yeah. That's like, What's the problem? Like you can totally ignore everything about Kubernetes. Like when I go to Home Depot, yep. I don't walk down the aisles of the more advanced tools and say, oh my God, why does this jackhammer exist? This hammer is all I need to hang pictures in my house. Yeah. yeah. Buy the hammer and totally ignore the jackhammer. Now look, one day, someone in the world, remember it's 8 billion people now, someone needs a jackhammer. Yeah. That person may not be you. It's okay. Like I think a lot of technologists has have this all or nothing thing, them versus Emacs, tab versus spaces. We can't help it. We can't understand why more tools exist in the world than I personally need. And then that creates this angst of like, ah, do I need to learn this tool even though I don't need it? But also the thing we have to understand is we work on teams yeah. at larger companies that tend to have larger concerns than the ones that are in our own field of view. Yeah. And so, for example, if my company says, we have a very simple app, yes, that monolith can run on a single server, yeah. no problem. Then you don't have any issues. Just automate that process and be done with it. Uh-oh, you got to keep the server patched. Uh-oh, if the server were to go down or the zone goes down, I need you to build a tool that can reschedule that app to a different zone. Uh-oh, you also need to update the load balancer. Hey, we also want metrics. And so you're like, man, that's a lot of stuff because this is now, this is what your customer is asking. Forget what Google's yeah. talking about. Your customer assumes that you can have a globally available, I'm not saying every customer, mm -hmm. but I'm saying a lot of people are just now used to this low latency experience from companies big and small. And so that single app on a single VM in a single zone ain't going to cut it in the competitive landscape. Mm -hmm. So what's your choice? 
you can definitely build all these things from scratch yourself. Great. But remember how we work as humans. We learn, we learn language from observation. Why do we speak English? I speak English because of where I was born. My parents speak English from where they were born. English is a very complex language. Yeah. Like we got duplicate words that mean the same thing, but not in certain contexts. It's, it's overly complicated, but I use the words I need. So today, if someone gave you the challenge of running a highly available application, how would you do it? Would you start where everyone else is with this thing we call Kubernetes? Do you build something from scratch? So I think we got to make sure we look at the trajectory. Kubernetes is like, like 10 years old. Yeah. So lots of people are coming in from running their own Kubernetes cluster from scratch and dealing with all of this complexity. I remember when people started with Linux, they used to build their Linux from scratch. They compile their own kernel, pick their own user land. And there was a big discussion around, should we even be using distros like Red Hat, Ubuntu, and Debian? Because they're so opinionated. They have their fancy package managers. I just want make and make install. Why do I need to get an RPM, right? Like this, but the thing is, the world is a big place. And once we kind of learn good patterns, just like software, yeah. when we learn how to do something, isn't on it for the language designers, the people who maintain standard libraries to try to create a implementation that most people could reuse. So we're not having people recreate all of these things themselves. So that's what I would say to people. Kubernetes is complex. You may not need Kubernetes. This is why I work on Cloud Run. I work on serverless stuff at Google, right? Yeah. And then attempt to replace Kubernetes. Yeah. But the Kubernetes API has been so great for articulating the things you want. I have an app. It needs this much memory, this much CPU. It needs a volume. It needs to run in the zone. It needs the sidecar container because I'm delegating some of my app stack to Apache or Nginx. Okay, we still need to describe that. And maybe it's not Kubernetes that actually runs it. Maybe you give that description to Cloud Run where there is no Kubernetes to be found. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I I I like that way of describing things. I I I think I think that's that fits very nicely with with my own philosophy of software development in terms of, you know, it's you know I, the way that I try to express it, it seems to, to, to me that our job as soft professional software developers is to solve problems with software not just to be good at the tools. So the tools are fantastic. It's important to have good tools and using tools that allow us to worry about you know, one part of the problem separated from another part of the problem and make changes in one part of the system without another and raise the bar on the level of abstraction so that we don't have to worry about some of the accidental complexity that's going on around us. It's all vitally important to be able to move quickly and eff efficiently. But fundamentally, the job is to solve the problems. And I, I, I would pull that message out from the way that you talked about that, which I like a lot.